Carolyn Van Dyken. Welcome back to the PT Genius Project. We have with us today Corey Blickenstaff from Vancouver, Washington, joining us for the second month of our second project where we're talking about serenity amongst the pushback. And we're really just talking about the pushback um, that we experience as clinicians on um, when using a, a biopsychosocial framework or the pushback that we have for ourselves and actually making the switch from a biomedical model to a biopsychosocial model. So we had a discussion between Susan and I last month and this month Corey's going to join and give us some of his thoughts and wisdom around this area because Corey's been very involved um, with the San Diego Pain Summit but also looking at integrating a biopsychosocial perspective into his clinical practice. So first of all, Welcome, Corey. Thank you so much for joining us and for giving us your time this afternoon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's fantastic. I wonder if you could uh, just introduce yourself with a little bit more detail and, and tell us a little bit more about your background. Sure. Um, so I'm a physical therapist. I practice in Vancouver, Washington, like you said. Um, I've been a PT since 2001, uh, originally practiced in Indiana for a few years, which is in the Midwest of uh, the United States, and now I'm on the West Coast. Um, primarily, I've worked in general uh, outpatient settings, orthopedic mostly, but you know, really kind of general. And uh, uh, my practice now is a little unique. I see, I, I set up my clinics inside of workplaces, and so, it's not, uh, you know, everybody's first question is always like, oh, so you're doing workers comp or industrial rehab or something like that. And not really. I mean, there's a little bit of that, but you know, it's really just like a clinic inside of a workplace. Mm -hmm. So people can come and see us for whatever. So I see, um, you know, a little bit of everything still. Uh, but that's a, you know, kind of gives me a unique perspective of a particular subset of patients and how they're interacting with their workplace and their employers and their supervisors and things like that. Um, I've got uh, a podcast that I do with Sandy Hilton, the Pain Science and Sensibility podcast. Um, I've uh, a couple times a year I do uh, weekend workshops for my it's called Edge Work classes, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, do a little bit of that. I have kids that are eight and eleven, so I'm chasing around my kids. You know, they're they're climbing on me and jumping on me and all that kind of stuff. So, so you need a bit of edge work for yourself once in a while. Totally, yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> Hey, we need to get up to Canada. Have you taught edge work in Canada yet? I have, yeah. Actually, I've been, uh, I've done uh, a, a workshop in Victoria and another one in Vancouver. I'm actually going back to Victoria uh, in June of this year. So nice. Well, we'll have to get you more towards Centre Canada. We'll have to yeah. get you to Toronto. Yeah, sounds great. Very cool. Well, Corey, I met Corey for the first time about six or seven years ago at the first San Diego Pain Summit, and Corey's just coming back again um, this weekend from, in fact, he flew in last night from, is this the seventh or sixth San Diego Pain Summit? Uh, sixth, I think. Yeah. Let's see, 2015? Yeah. Math? No one told me there'd be math. No. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you this is the first one I've missed, and I've been, I was so sad to have missed it. it just, I'm going to go to London for the abdominal pelvic pain conference in May, and it just, I couldn't swing both. So can you give us a couple of highlights around um, you know, sort of what you learned or what you found really interesting about this year's conference? Uh, yeah, so um, you know, Rajam always does a great job finding really uh, unique speakers. Uh, this year's keynote was Antonio Damasio, uh, who is a cognitive neuroscientist he's, he's a pretty big deal um you know and, and she's had speakers like this on multiple occasions so just you know not not only not something you would typically see at a at a physical therapy or a, or a healthcare provider conference but you know kind of a big deal just in scientific circles in general he's um you know he's a guy who's uh you know he, he's to the level that he's working on theories of consciousness and things like this wow so yeah. really up there. wow um, so his was really good. Uh, you know, he talked a little bit about, um, you know, roles of homeostasis, the physiology of feeling was what his talk was about. Um, the other keynote was Tim Beams, uh, from, the, from the UK mm -hmm. gave an excellent talk as well. Uh, he did a real nice, he kind of did a nice little synopsis of, of everybody's presentations up to that point, which. You wow. know, it was incredible in and of itself. It's like, you know, thinking about how whenever I present something, I'm like obsessing over my slides for <laughs> like, he just, he just put that in there. Like, you know, since last night and like, okay. Right, right. 
So, uh, um, but yeah, and then there were several other speakers there as well. Uh, Mark Bishop was one that was notable who talked about uh, uh, utilizing placebo and kind of uh, what the ins and outs of that means. Um, you know, basically how to maximize you know, why I took away from it was kind of maximizing nonspecific effects, basically, um, right. you know, and, uh, um, several other speakers, Keith Waldron was there who gave a really uh, poignant talk about his journey through, um, you know, pain science as all of us have gone through and just made some interesting comments about how, uh, you know, some of this stuff is so complex that, how are we even to make a, uh, a judgment about whether it's good or bad? You know, it's like, uh, he's like, I would have to get a degree in physics and a degree in statistics to even be able to look at this information in a critical enough way to determine if what they're saying is, is good or not, you know? So just, I, I think, you know, the, the, the audience just kind of collectively was like, yeah, you know, okay, good. I'm not the only one that finds this stuff difficult. So, um, but yeah, several other speakers. What's great about the San Diego Pain Conference, in addition to the speakers, is kind of what happens in between, in the in-between spaces. You're talking with, with other people and kind of getting an idea of what their perspectives are and what they're working on and what they took away from the presentations. And honestly, some of that stuff is, is usually some of the best stuff. It's a very interactive summit, isn't it? And, and you really get a chance to kind of know, know the people and, and really have a discussion on... Theology, theology. I'm talking religion here, but, <laughs> but theory, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, right? And just kind of that background and how do we make sense of it? Um, yeah, and everybody's so approachable. I mean, I had multiple people say that to me. It's like it's just so nice that everybody is so approachable. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's great. I, I would really highly recommend people put that on their list of uh, go-to conferences if it's not already. Yeah, that's great. So, Corey, um, I, I, we've certainly met, I think, at the first San Diego Pain Conference, and, and I believe you presented at that conference I did. Um, about your edge work um, uh, program or exercises, I guess, is sort of how you might look at that. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your journey um, as an orthopedic therapist moving or shifting from a biomedical perspective to a biopsychosocial, because that's where there's so much pushback. Like, how do we make that change? How did you do it? Yeah, I think, you know, in my case, um, you know, like I said, I worked a few years in a clinic in Indiana. And at that point, as a young therapist, I was cutting my, you know, we all kind of pick a, a direction that we cut our teeth on. In my particular case, it was uh, Shirley Sarman's movement impairment syndrome approach which is very, uh, you know, pattern driven and you're looking for, you know, balance and things like this. And, um, you know, and it worked really well for me. My patients, you know, got better, did well. And then I moved to the West coast and all of a sudden I'm working in a clinic that had a really high population of chronic pain, uh, patients with persistent pain. And all of a sudden my, my outcomes were terrible. My patients weren't doing very well. Right. So, and that really is what kind of drove the change for me, really. It was the patients. Um, and I think that's continued to be the case to some degree or another over time is that, you know, the, if you listen to your patients, they'll kind of tell you where you need to go um, and, where, uh, and where you need to go to be helping them the best. But, um, you know, at that point, I started digging a little deeper. I, that's when I, you know, found Lorimer Mosley's information and, and kind of followed that down, uh, whatever rabbit holes that that took me down and I continue to be on. Um, but as, uh, I think as time has gone by and as, uh, these approaches kind of evolve, um, you know, the, the thing that you feel and the thing that you hear from other people is okay. So this is information that makes sense, but there's always been a little bit of a challenge of how to make it practical. Right. You mentioned the San Diego pain summit. I mean, that's basically the reason that exists was to help make that jump. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, um, I feel like that's kind of the, the progression at this point is how to, how do you take this information? Okay. Yes, we know, we know certain things now, we know certain things aren't true. Um, but what does that mean for us and how we practice? Um, and that's really kind of been, um, you know, my, my focus in recent years, I guess, is how to make that shift. 
Okay. So how, can you give us an example of, of how you have made that shift and how you might look at patients differently? So, so maybe a bit about what your framework might look like, because that I think is essentially what has to change, right? We have to make a framework shift, which is what's difficult. Yeah. I, I mean, I think for one, <clears throat> one of the earliest shifts to make is um, from seeing that person you're working with as a, uh, as a broken item to be fixed, right? To, uh, to a person to interact with. One of the most influential things that I encountered, excuse me, was, um, was some of the work by John Quintner and Milton Cohen. They talked about uh, working within the intersubjective space, which basically is just saying that, uh, you know, really the thing that changes or, or the thing that you can impact is what the person takes back from your interaction and integrates personally, right? Like we're not in there truly manipulating anything. We're working with them and they either internalize it or they don't. And they go back and they, and they change the way they're interacting with their own environment. So when you think that way, it really changes the, you know, the targets of your interventions and the things that you're doing. So um, because of that, I've felt like, our role as therapists is uh, what I call contextual architects, right? So we're not so much we're not so much working to change something within the patient. We're more kind of the uh, uh, we're kind of the helper that sets up an environment so that they can get to that change themselves, right? right. right? And that's that shift in thinking um, really made a big difference for me. Another big one was uh, to kind of go along with that was to stop looking for dysfunctions right i mean of course there are presentations where there there is something wrong that needs to heal and and you know a certain amount of of uh you know tissue healing or you know for lack of a better word that needs to occur but a lot of times that's that's long long past and it's a matter of them moving forward and trying to figure out how to get uh kind of get build a bridge back to their their valued life. So, um, I, I feel like if we, if we switch our, our switch conceptually, what we're looking for from what are the things that are wrong to what are the opportunities for change that that'll really make a big difference in how you're going to interact with that person and how things are going to proceed. And and they're going to hear that difference and it's going to make a, a, you know, a big difference in driving self-efficacy and motivation and these types of things. Instead of hearing like, oh my gosh, I got these 14 things wrong with my shoulder. Yeah. It's, there are some things that can change and that can get better. And here are some ways to do them. Right. It's just, right. it's much more empowering. And let's celebrate the things that are actually really good, right? Like you actually have really good range of motion. Um, there's some strength issues here. Or things are a bit sensitized here, but you know, instead of always talking about what's wrong, like focusing on what's right and how you can build that up more. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And even if they're lacking range of motion or they're missing yeah. strength or they're missing, they have yeah. some impairment, yeah. they'd be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, we've got something. There's definitely some things we can be doing about that. Right. right? Yeah. Um, These are all things that can change, mm -hmm. you know, quite easily. So I just wanted to take one step back for everybody listening. Cause I know that, you know, talking about the framework and what kind of spurred your framework to change on, but, you didn't just throw out what you know about movement, right? You still right. used movement. I mean, you had a pretty good framework of movement from what you, you know, discussed earlier in your days in Indiana and how you looked at movement. Can you talk just a little bit about how you kept the things that you know about movement, what you could use with movement to kind of interact into that framework of, you know, getting the patient to, you know, to internally come up with the ways to move and change and to build the self efficacy efficacy and you know return that locus of control to the patient with your verbal stuff um you know and just talking to them in ways that they're not broken but in you know interacting as a person i believe were your words and i love that um can you talk about how you can kind of blend that movement piece with that a bit so that people can see that you're still doing movement we're just how we're setting it up is very different than the way we used to under a this is you know this is broken or dysfunctional and so we must fix that yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I still, you know, that, that's one of the, the things that you hear sometimes is people are kind of working through the, uh, you know, some of the new science regarding pain is like, so what do you just talk to your patients now? You don't have a move or anything anymore. So just definitely not true. So, um, 
you know, I mentioned that I originally kind of cut my teeth in the, in the Shirley Sarman world. You know, I'm no longer an advocate of that, but if you watch some of the things that I do, you would definitely recognize, you mm-hmm. know, somebody who, somebody else who grew up in that, in that framework would definitely recognize some of the things that I do. So it, it's not necessarily that you're not using the things that you like to use or the things that you've gotten used to using. It's just the reasons that you use them for might change. So, you know, for me, as things progressed and I started looking into different uh, approaches and things, one that really made sense was some of the exposure based information that was out there. And so, um, you know, basically it's a shift again, kind of from dysfunction towards opportunity Mm -hmm. instead of looking at a person and saying like, okay, they've got, uh, you know, this problem with this muscle group and this lack of range of motion and this and that. So now those are my targets. And more thinking in terms of what playing with their grandchildren is really important to this person. And the reason they can't do that right now is because they can't hang on to their granddaughter with their arm. And part of the part of something that's wrapped up in that that is changeable is that they don't have range of motion and, and, and strength and some of these types of things. So now all of a sudden you're doing these things within a context of what really matters to them. The reasons why they, they come to us, they don't come to us because I'm lacking 20 degrees of motion. They lack, they come to us because I want to play with my grandkids and I can't Mm -hmm. do it. Right. So, um, people come to see us for movement related problems. And so the things that, you know, the context that we're going to work with them on is going to be in the language of movement. So, um, so yeah, definitely. And, and, uh, you know, a big part of a successful interaction with a patient is not only, um, you know, finding the movements and the exercises and, th- and the things that are going to speak to them and that they enjoy, but also something that you feel confident enough and comfortable enough that you can relate to them. So there's, you know, you're always going to kind of have your own flavor of, uh, of movements and things that you like, and that's, and that's fine. I think that's, it's healthy. Mm-hmm. So long as you're working within that framework of finding something that, that works for the person, right? Not being so focused on, no, this is the thing that I do, you know, like, yeah, no, that, that's great. I know you like doing that exercise. We're not doing that. Cause I, I do this. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is sort of why we talked about, you know, our framework needs to be consistent. I mean, all three of us on this call probably approach a patient quite differently from the exercise we might prescribe, or maybe from some of the manual therapy uh, pieces that we might do. But what we should have in common is the language we use with our patients, Mm -hmm. the framework that they're not broken, they're not fragile, that there's opportunities that they can change their tissues, um, that we need to create, you know, placebo and expectancy and and develop self-efficacy. Those are sort of the key pieces. And then what we put into those are going to be very individualized. Corey, you know, grew up, cut his teeth on Shirley Simon. I grew up, cut my teeth on Mackenzie, right? Mm -hmm. Susan, you grew up, cut your teeth on manual therapy, right? Yep. So we're all going to have some of those different motor control, mechanical, manual skills. But I would say that we would all sit here and agree on those basic tenets, which I think is really important moving forward as a profession. Yeah, I find this all, I love the, the part that you were talking about, Corey, about the, something as simple as I want to be able to hug my grandchildren or corral them, even, you know, like I want to be able to like bring them in so they're not in danger. Any of those kinds of things, you're not going to get to that if you don't ask them what's important to them. And I think that brings back to that whole interactive piece rather than, oh, your shoulder, let's fix your shoulder. Instead, you were interacting with that person to find out what was important to them and then couching it up into that framework that, that's meaningful to them. Um, before I went into the manual therapy world, I spent most of my early career working in uh, uh, rehab and with neurologically impaired patients. And so when I started working outside of, you know, the neuro patients, that's what I brought into the world with, with, you know, with orthopedic problems was I just started looking at them because that's what I always did. You know, we knew what the patients wanted to do. They wanted to be able to walk, get up and down, get in and out of bed, be able to do those basic things. And then as they got better, we could work on more complex tasks with them and never really worried about if they're, you know, what we never like made huge range of motion, you know, like comments about their knee, even though their knee hurt a little bit, it's like, well, how can we move without your knee hurting so much so that you can still do the things that you need to do? And, um, and I, 
so we have that exposure as PTs and bridging the gap should be easier rather than harder because I think we have all had that somewhere in some part of our, you know, early years as a PT, even if it was just, you know, that time during, you know, certain training or certain, you know, educational aspects and things like that. So, but I think finding what's meaningful is like a key there to helping them because then what they're saying matters to you. And so that's really, I think, one of the big drivers of self-efficacy, like, oh, this is important to me, and they think it's important too. So I'm onto something here as the patient, rather than people don't really want to hear what I want. They just want to, you know, I just need my shoulder fixed. That's kind of where they're coming into it, because that's what they've always heard, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, you're really onto something too with the neuro background. I've always felt like... Um, Folks who have a strong background or who've worked in neuro settings before are well situated to work with people in pain. I find that a lot of times people who've worked in that setting and are, are, are changing into a clinic where they might be seeing a lot of folks with pain, they're like, you know, I, I don't do this stuff. I've always worked in neuro. And I was like, no, you know how to do this. You already, you know, when you go see somebody in neuro, you're not like, okay, great. The goal is for you to be able to stand on one foot for five seconds. It's like, no, the goal is for them to do those things so that they can transfer safely and be in their home environment. Mm -hmm. You know, so they've already got a good grasp of, uh, of tying it to things of value. Um, you know, typically they are really good at, at drawing in what social support structures that they have and how important that is. So I really, I really feel like strong neuro rehab background is a, perfect precursor to working with folks in pain. It's just, uh, you know, it's a little, it's a little different treatment context and you're probably seeing people for different reasons, but I, I, I think that's an easier switch myself. Yeah, I would um, agree. So Corey, can you tell us a little bit about edge work and, and what, mm -hmm. why is it that you created sort of this novel movement approach for people in pain? What, what was it about the need to do something differently that drove this thought process? Um, well, I was at the time, um, I was really interested in trying to find what, uh, what things had in common. So, you know, as I was working through this change, I was like, okay, we got all these different approaches out there and all these different things. And they all say they're coming at it from different angles. So I'm like, there's gotta be some commonalities here. And through that process of trying to, um, come to some kind of a reconciliation there, uh, I kind of whittled it away to a few things that, that I, I felt like were commonalities in what I did. So, um, and, you know, of course, at the time I was also, I was reading a lot of Feldenkrais and, you know, there's obvious influences to the things that I do. Um, but so the novel movement <clears throat> side of things, excuse me, the way I describe it now, it's like you're trying to find a different way to do the same thing, right? Like if it hurts to bend forward, right? There are components of that or, you know, tying your shoe, whatever. So you can find, you know, if you change something about the way they perform that task or that movement, you might be able to find a different path into the same endpoint. And that's, you know, in a nutshell, what, what novel movements is. And there's lots of different ways you can do that. And, you know, we've got ways we talk about, okay, you can kind of sequentially work through some thought process to find something that might be successful. Um, Edgework kind of grew out of, uh, you know, where I was at at the time looking at neurodynamic treatments and movements and uh, uh, somebody I interact with online, her name's uh, Nari Strange, is in Australia. And I was at the time I was looking at, uh, you know, how to use tensioners and sliders and things like that, in neurodynamic movements. And she just said, you know, try just taking them to that first point where they notice the sensation and then come away from it and try it again and do that. And I, you know, I had that, <laughs> that patient the next day that I did that with and I was like, oh my gosh. Like this changes everything, right? <laughs> you know? And uh, so, um, so and that's basically in a nutshell what you do with edge work. It's a matter of kind of uh, um, it has a few components. So you're you're trying to get the person to um, to be aware of what they're feeling as they're going through a movement or a task, and it not just being on an on and an off switch, right? Trying to kind of find a point where I call it finding that place where things kind of start to get protective, kind of the beginnings of that, okay. you know, so they can kind of start to feel and it gets them exploring their environment a little bit. And then once they, once they can do that, then it's about engaging um, 
engaging with the process at that point. So I, I think in terms of what it might be doing, uh, there are some stuff in the ACT literature that talks about like a willingness to engage with symptoms, like how, how willing are you to, uh, to, to have symptoms. And a lot of times people, at the time they've, they come to us, they've been told, don't do that. If it hurts, don't do that. Stay away from things that hurt. Right. Right. So this is kind of a way that gives them a nice safe space that they can kind of start to explore their movements and see whether or not when they play around at that edge, uh, if things change, it kind of brings some control or a sense of um, uh, an ability to predict what might happen. Right. They can say, okay, well, you know, things improved a little bit or I got a little bit more motion or now I know, you know, it's maybe a little worse on this part of my motion than it is over here. So I can work over here more than what I have. So it gets people instead of contracting and taking away, you know, though this is just another thing I can't do because it might hurt to start thinking about how might I explore those boundaries and find places where it's expanding and how can I make it expand? Um, and, it, and then at that point you can really incorporate education and you mentioned self-efficacy. So it's really, um, you know, because they're feeling themselves where the symptoms are, I'm not telling them where to stop the motion. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to help them understand, you know, what things they might be feeling and then what to do at that point. So it's totally driven by them. And so, uh, you know, to me, self-efficacy is kind of a nice combination between uh, a couple of things. Uh, do I expect I'm going to get better? And do I think I'm going to be able to drive that process? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a kind of a combination of locus of control and recovery expectations. Um, you know, and the better, the more, those two things are both really good predictors of recovery, right? If somebody expects they're going to get better, they're way more likely to get better. And if somebody feels like they can get there themselves, they're way less likely to need ongoing care. So, um, so I, I just feel like that's a great focus for, for all of our treatments. And, you know, I always put up this big slide, don't steal self-efficacy, right? Like try to, you know, try not to be doing things that make it, make it the opposite way where it feels like, okay, that got better, but only because that therapist was doing it for me. Right. right. Or somebody did something to me and that's why I got better rather than I was able to actually drive this train myself. I think, you know, when you were talking about that, um, for those out there listening, uh, one of the things that, that comes to mind is that what the evidence really supports here is knowledge of results and knowledge of performance. And we know that in motor control and movement, that that's critical to uh, creating skill. And what you're doing is helping people get those internal cues, not the external ones so much, but the internal ones to really be able to tell, you know, like you said, explore and feel where in that movement pattern can I do this? Where do I feel comfortable about this? Where do I feel more afraid about this? Um, but it does lend them into that knowledge of results and knowledge of performance piece, which is beautiful when you think about people being able to have the ability to continue on and change the next part and the next part. And then they're going to go home and do it some more because now it's kind of their brain has a target. and It's like, oh, I want to do a little, how, how much more can we go over this way? What can we do over this way? So... I, I, I think that that's um, just a really nice piece that I got out of your course for sure. And I think you've given yeah, them permission course. to play, mm -hmm. right? You've given them permission to just explore and not give mm -hmm. them too many rules. People in persistent pain have too many rules that they mm -hmm. give themselves that we give them. And I think this type of approach gives them a novel experience. It's multi-planar movement. There are no rules. You listen to the edge of your symptoms and then you just explore, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and one of the one of the most um, anxiety provoking things about pain is its uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, if you flip that switch from looking for dysfunctions towards opportunities, you know, instead of thinking like, okay, I'm looking for things I shouldn't be doing, to looking for these are things I can be doing. These are things. This is something I can be doing more of in these directions. I mean, that's that's reassuring in and of itself, and it also. You know, when we know what the path might look like moving forward, that also is reassuring. So when people have a roadmap of, you know, this is one of the big things that we can provide when they can come in and say, okay, tell me you've seen this before. Tell me I'm not the only person that's ever had this, right? And, and what's the next couple of weeks going to look like or the next couple of months going to look like? And showing them some things that they can work on. I mean, that alone is just reassuring to know that there's there's something I can be trying here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. Corey, what's been the most rewarding 
part for you making this switch? If you think about starting with Shirley Sarman's work and moving into pain and, and really looking at a broader perspective, what personally and, and professionally from a personal standpoint, what have you enjoyed the most in that process? Um, I really like that, uh, you know, looking at things in this way, um, it's, it's no longer me. I always was uncomfortable at the beginning with, with the thought that I'm telling somebody what's right or wrong about their movement or these, I mean, who am I to say what's right or wrong about what somebody else is doing? Right. You know, versus now kind of more in the role as a, as a helper instead of a fixer, you can kind of see people regain that and, you know, being empowered, you know, and feeling like they're, you know, seeing that they're still steering the ship and they're still a good captain or you know, yeah. whatever other silly metaphor you want to use. But, uh, yeah. you know, I think that that's pretty rewarding. Yeah. Um, you know, which is hard at first on the switch. Cause you know, at the beginning it can be, uh, it can be easy to get caught up in the person like, you know, Oh my gosh, you saved my life. You fixed me, you know, like that, you know, like mm -hmm. that can feel pretty good, at, especially at first. Right. Yeah. But you know, when you start to, I always say there's this one patient that, uh, really clarified this for me. And, you know, I, I'd spent all this time working on him, showing him a different way to move his shoulder, this and that. I mean, I was working my tail off trying to, trying to help him figure this out. He just couldn't, he just couldn't feel how he was moving back there very well. And at the end of all this, he was like, it's pretty great how I figured that out. And I was behind him and I can remember just, I can remember making this face like what I just spent 45 minutes showing you this. But then I, I, you know, I gathered myself and I thought, you know what, that's perfect. Like every patient, Right. said that that would be just perfect i want them giving themselves credit for it right. not me like that and that that's a good sign for how things are going to progress for him yeah. moving forward so mm -hmm. you know that kind of <laughs> as far as a a moment in time that clarified the switch that needed to happen that was it for me so right, right. Yeah. well and what a what a great way to kind of summarize this concept of self-efficacy really right as you gave him or continue to boost up his self-efficacy would have been so easy to say I helped you with that. I did that. I gave you the thought. Right. You know what? You did it. And I was just kind of alongside you, which is fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. Where's my pet on the back? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And we do need a bit of that. Don't get me wrong. But I think we get enough of that even in this process, right? Our patients are very grateful for having their lives back again in a very meaningful way. Yeah. And, you know, you just can't beat that really. Right? For sure. Again, it's back to that value piece, right? You've given them back what they value or they've given themselves back what they value and you were just along for the ride, really. We're coaches. I think that's what we are. Absolutely. Yeah. Let them be the superhero. Right, exactly. Well, everybody should be the superhero in their own life, right? Yeah, you should be the superhero in your mm -hmm. life. Well, I think we will leave it on that note. Corey, thank you so much for your time and for your, your thoughts and wisdom in, in the switch that is really difficult for all of us to make, but so rewarding. Um, it's a process, right? This didn't happen overnight. Definitely. It's yeah. still, still ongoing. Ongoing, I would agree. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree with that one for sure. Mm -hmm. In a month's time, we are going to come back and have another conversation with Corey, and we're going to invite... Um, 10 of you to come alongside and ask Corey some questions and have a discussion with the three of us around these concepts that we're talking about the you know the pushback that we have or the pushback that our patients might have when we make this change from a biomedical to a biopsychosocial framework so thank you again Corey for your time um, Susan do you have anything to add to that I don't have anything to add except that if you will uh, check out the website we will have links to the San Diego pain summit and uh, to Pain, Science, and Sensibility, which is Corey's um, podcast with Sandry, uh, Sandy Hilton. And also, um, you know, a link to um, his website where you can find him and his edge work. Um, it's a wonderful course. If you have the opportunity and you're in the area, check it out. And, and I highly recommend it. Yeah. Thank awesome. you for having me on. Yeah, Thank you, Corey. Me. Thanks so much fun. for being here. Of course. My pleasure. All right. We'll see everybody next time. Take care.